Hey, please um, give a fantastic round of applause for Katie Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time ever in London. Thank you. Um, and it's my first time giving a presentation like this, so a lot of firsts going on right now. <laughs> I really appreciate that energy. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, first time getting here. And when I travel, I usually travel with someone or I'm meeting, getting met at the airport. Um, and this time I was really nervous. I'm like, people are talking about the tube, talking about the underground, the overground, um, the buses. And in Atlanta, where I'm from, I don't use any public transportation. I either drive or walk where I need to go. So I was really, really nervous about that. But I had a strategy. And my strategy was just to ask every black person I encountered to help me. Um, and thankfully, um, everyone I asked helped me. People even walked me where I needed to go if the directions were a little bit convoluted, so that was awesome. Shout out to black people for helping each other across the diaspora. Um, and when you're coming from the U.S. and you're telling people you're going to London, they, we have like certain perceptions. I'm sure you have perceptions of Americans as well. And you know, the perceptions is like the Londoners keep to themselves. Um, they're not gonna be in your business. They, they don't want to have anything to do with you. So I was like pleasantly surprised that um, all the black people I encountered in the airport on the tube were very helpful. Um, one thing that they did ask me a lot though, when I came and asked for like pretty, I guess, simple directions, they, they asked, are you American? And I felt like that was a very loaded question. You can't really ask people if they're American after 2016 without, <laughs> without you know, me feeling some type of way, so I'm like, hmm, am I American? I, I, are you not gonna help me if I'm American? Um, but I hedged a little bit and I said, well, I'm from Atlanta, um, thinking that one, they wouldn't know anything about Atlanta and say okay, or two, they would know a little bit like trap music and good food and be willing to help me, so that worked in my favor. So like I said, really excited to be here. Big thank you to Afrotech for holding this space. Um, could we get a round of applause for Afrotech? Um, especially huge shout out to Abby. She answered what seems like hundreds of my questions via email um, at pretty odd hours too because I was not respecting the time difference, so thank you, Abby. Um, thank you to um, Richness for having us here. This is a really cool venue. Um, and the participants that came before me, the speakers, they really raised the bar, so shout out to y'all, but also like why'd y'all do that? And then um, to you all, um, the audience, I've been sitting in the audience, people have been really interactive, really talking to each other. Um, I've been hanging back a little bit, but people have been coming up to me, asking me all sorts of questions, um, asking me about what I do. And it's really cool to see that there's black folks out here in the UK um, doing similar things that we're trying to do in the US. So definitely gonna take that message back when I get home tomorrow. Um, so my talk is called Subverting the Expert Using Accessible Technology. And when I say accessible technology, I'm not necessarily talking about disabilities in this context. I'm talking about um, technology that pretty much anyone can access. So think Twitter, Instagram, Google Hangouts, stuff like that, WhatsApp. Um, so just to level set, um, trigger warnings, I will make a mention of depression and gaslighting. That is not what my talk is about, but I do understand um, if that's triggering to some folks. And also, I'm from the South, we're big on call and response, interacting with folks, so I'm gonna ask that you all humor me and answer my non-hypothetical or rhetorical questions. And at one point, um, I'm gonna get down, boots on the ground, and have um, you all talking to each other, um, and hopefully you'll feel comfortable to share out. Everyone sound good with that? Cool. All right, so I told you that I'm prone to getting lost. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. My name is Katie Mitchell, which someone told me is a British last name, which I wasn't aware. So maybe I'm European or something. Um, I go by Black Katie on the internet. And that's because I'm black and my name is Katie. But um, going through school, university, and even my first jobs, I would you know, put in my application, talk to people on the phone, and you know, I think everything's cool, everything's sweet. And then I get into the, in the room where no one's met me before, they've only seen me on paper and talked to me on the phone, and their jaws literally drop. They see 
me, dark skin, big afro, sometimes some really, some really big gold hoops, you know, and they're like, what, what do you want? And I'm like, oh, I'm here for the interview. I'm here for this event. I'm here for that event. And they're like, what? We only have one interview or we only, we're, we're expecting Katie. Um, so after a few times that happened, they were like, oh, they're expecting a white woman. Cool. So I start going by Black Katie on the internet. And even in these situations, I started explicitly telling people, like, do you know I'm black? Um, and that can be pretty awkward. Um, people who weren't expecting me to be black didn't like that. Um, so that was a weed out for me and them, so that's cool. Um, so I go by Black Katie and I um, tell people I'm black before they have a chance to be surprised now. Um, so I'm a writer. I write about tech and race. And I like kale and collard greens. You can take that um, as a metaphor or you can take that literally because both are true. Um, so I have over 10 years writing and content development experience. Um, I'm only 26, so I am counting my high school yearbook and newspaper. Um, I have a BS and MS in public policy from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And when I was studying, I was focusing on um, racial health disparities. So a lot of time in the US, um, a common phrase is like your zip code kind of determines your life expectancy. Someone who just lives five miles away from someone else, completely different world in the US. And maybe the same here. I'm getting some nods, so maybe it's the same here. Um, I've led content strategy for startups in Atlanta and San Francisco. The Atlanta one was focused on Lean Six Sigma, very small startup. I was the third full-time employee. And the um, San Francisco startup is actually called Instacart. Do you all, have y'all heard of Instacart? Is it here yet in, the, in London? Ish. Okay, so for those who don't know, Instacart does um, online grocery delivery through an app. Um, pretty cool, and I had a great time doing that. And now I'm a technical writer at Salesforce. Um, Salesforce is global. We have an office in London, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that if those are if you're interested in Salesforce. My boss told me to plug away <laughs> to get people um, on our team, so we are looking for folks. Um, and I'm a remote worker, so I live in Atlanta, but. People, everyone on my team's remote, so they live all over the world. So yeah, let's get into it. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. I wanted to lay it out so everyone knows, um, no surprises. So we are going to be redefining what it means to be an expert. Um, I'm a writer, I like definitions, and I want us all to be on the same page throughout this talk. And we're going to be examining experts. So I have three case studies of people who I deem experts, and hopefully you'll deem them an expert too as we get our shared definition. Um, and then we're gonna be defining your expertise. So um, I know a lot of people in the audience um, work in technology, but I want you to think outside the box, think outside your nine to five or whatever you do to make money and think about your experience and then we're gonna share those out and think about how we can share those out to um, folks who aren't in this room. Everybody good with that? Okay, so this is y'all's first test. <laughs> um, what does it mean to be an expert? And you can take some time to think about it, and then you can shout it out. Um, when you hear the word expert, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Knowledgeable, okay. Qualified. Official. Efficient, okay. Experienced. Being very good at something, great. Um, those are all things that I was thinking about when I wanted to redefine what it meant to be an expert because growing up and being um, in school and getting my master's and having to um, defend dissertations and such, expert meant that you had a degree. Has anyone, does anyone feel that way or has that been like pushed on you? Like if you're an expert, you need a degree or if you're an expert, you need to be cited in this journal or this person needs to know your name, you need to be connected to these type of people. So um, like I said, I talked about racial health disparities when I was in school and I wrote a lot of papers um, and I would throw it back all the way to you know slavery and sharecropping. My white professors were a little uncomfortable with that, but um, it really does inform a lot of things that are happening in the US today. And they would say, you know, you need to quote this person or this person needs to be in your paper. And I'm like, how are you gonna tell me the granddaughter of sharecroppers, 
then my grandparents telling me how sharecropping was is less legitimate than someone who kind of studied Mississippi um, a semester in college. So redefining what an expert means, um, I totally reject that now. Um, and I'm encouraging other people in school to reject that to, to the degree that they can, right? I'm not saying like tell your professors off and not get your degree because, you know, we know how parents are. That wouldn't be cool. That wouldn't fly. But really, think about people and um, I say your lived experience informs your expertise, right? Um, this might sound corny, but I'm going to say it anyway. Nobody is as good at as good at being you than you are. Super corny, but it's true. Think about your lived experience. Like really think about what you've been through. Um, think about the best times in your life, the worst times in your life, and think about what got you there. I know a lot of the time we're always trying to level up, right? It's like, I'm right here, but I'm trying to get to that next thing. I'm trying to be this, I'm trying to make millions. But like what got you here and what even inspires you to even reach further? And people are going to be interested in that. For example, someone who doesn't have a degree has a great impact. I'm pretty sure you know this person, um, Harriet Tubman. So she led um, hundreds of enslaved Africans to freedom. She didn't have a degree in leading people to freedom. She used um, the stars. She's actually known as like the first environmental feminist because she used stars, land, her knowledge, of the land and her thirst for freedom and her um, thirst for justice to do that. So I think Harriet Tubman is an excellent example of using your lived experience and then reaching back and helping others. Because like people don't innately know how to um, escape slavery, right? You have to work at it um, and you have to share that knowledge. And even um, storytelling and sharing knowledge in the American black community, like I said, got us out of slavery in a lot of cases and it also um, helped us keep our culture. We were brought to the US um, forcibly, and then a lot of us couldn't read or write, but we had that storytelling and that knowledge sharing to keep um, the genealogy, keep our ancestry intact until later generations could write that down and like make that a part of our history. Um, another example close to home, my mom. She's been a homemaker for 32 years. Um, never worked outside the home, was always there um, to bake cookies for me and my brother when we got home. It was lit. I miss that. Wish she would do that now. Um, but yeah, she's like the black Martha Stewart. And now that I live outside the house, I'm like, yo, like, why can't I fold a fitted sheet like my mom? Or why doesn't my house smell lemony fresh all the time? But it's a skill, right? She doesn't have a degree in homemaking. But I bet if she um, tried to share that knowledge, um, a lot of people would benefit from it. So shout out to Catherine, that's my mom. Um, she's a homemaker and she's the best at, to do it. Um, but she's, you know, not on internet, not on YouTube, doesn't have her own channel, not sharing that knowledge. But maybe if she's listening to the live stream, she should think about it, right? Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna um, go into the case studies now. And another thing before I do, I want to say that my examples um, can get a bit silly. And I think that's, it's intentional, right? I want us as black people to be able to give ourselves that levity and give ourselves that light. A lot of time, and I'm not knocking this at all, as black people, we feel like we need to change the world because we know that we can. We want to solve homelessness. We want to solve these big societal problems. But sometimes, like, just have fun. Use your expertise just to have fun. Um, be silly. And yeah, let's get into it. So like I said, I'm from Atlanta. And whenever I tell people I'm from Atlanta, everyone wants to talk about trap music. And I can talk about it, so don't worry. Um, have y'all heard of Lil Nas X? He kind of just hopped on the scene. So I'm getting some Nas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, cool, cool. I wasn't sure. I was like, do people in the um, UK know about him yet? Um, so yeah, Lil Nas X got the horses in the back, as some of y'all already know. He's a singer, rapper, and songwriter. But before he was those things, he was an internet and Twitter personality. So um, you may not know, before um, he got really, really famous, literally like last week, <laughs> he actually had like a Nicki Minaj fan page on Twitter, and that's how he got his following. It was called Nas Mirage. I think they shut it down, though. 
But so he had this big following just sharing Nicki Minaj news. Um, Cause you know, people want to hear about Nicki Minaj. So that's how he got his following. And then he started doing these threads on Twitter, like choose your own adventure threads. So like you're stuck in a haunted house, like what do you do? Um, and you, you know, the polls that Twitter has. And so then if you, he had his own thing that you were supposed to do. And if you deviated away from them, like you died or like something like really catastrophic ha happened to you. So then he gained some more followers from that. So he built on Nas Mirage, did his choose your own adventure Twitter um, polls. And then his followers actually told him like, hey, you should make music. So he used his expertise on like having command of his Twitter following and being able to engage with them in a certain way. His followers were saying like, you should make music, you should make music, we will listen to it, like we make you go viral. So he's already going viral anyway with these other things, like hey, might as well, everyone's going viral these days, right? So he made a song called Old Town Road, and I don't wanna say it's the first country trap hit, but it's the first country trap hit. Um, do y'all remember, I think it was like the early 2000s, um, Nelly and Tim McGraw. So like, I don't know if that was like trap, but it was definitely a precursor. Like Nelly ran to Lil Nas X could fly. Um, so yeah, he used his expertise to make this song. And for those who haven't heard it, do not worry. <laughs> Silly example, but it really shows what knowing your expertise and having your niche down can do. No one was really thinking about country trap. Now I'm ready for this album. Like I am ready to hear the Lil Nas X album. And he actually broke one of Drake's records um, of like most streamed single in a day. Got a hundred million streams, like breaking Drake's record. And my man's like started off on SoundCloud, living at his sister's crib, not paying any bills and him, her kicking him out. So thinking about your expertise and like what you can do to shape the world, like I think Lil Nas X is a perfect example of that. And I know we're not taking questions at the end, but if at any time you want to shout out and say something, like feel free. Um, we're going to be talking in like smaller groups, but if you want to shout out while I'm on stage, I will not be offended at all. Um, and so my second um, case study is Kyle Womb. Kyle creates dope technology for the culture. He was my classmate at Georgia Institute of Technology. He has a bachelor's of science in computer science. Um, he's a software engineer at Twilio, one of our sponsors. Shout out Twilio for being the inclusion sponsor. Um, and he helps non-developers create apps. So folks like me who, y'all saw me struggling with the computer. Um, folks like me go from idea to in the app store 90 days. So that's Kyle. But my favorite thing about Kyle is that he's a Drake stan. Whenever I'm hanging out with him, that's all he wants to listen to. Half of what he wants to talk about. And that's what, that's what his expertise is. If there was a degree in Aubrey Graham, he would get it. So um, raise your hand if you have an Instagram. OK. Raise your hand if you use song lyrics for your captions on Instagram. This is a safe space. So yeah, I know, I know more of y'all do. But that's OK. That's OK. I'll let y'all hide. Um, so does anyone use Drake captions in particular on Instagram? I'm, I'm getting too personal now. OK. <laughs> so Kyle, um, like I said, Drake stan. 
loves him some Drake and is always using Drake captions on Instagram, um, always tweeting them out. So this is one is a, a picture of him when he was studying abroad in Germany. And the caption says, 7 a.m. in Germany, can't believe that they heard of me. Um, and obviously that comes from one of Drake's songs. And if you can see in the, um, the comments, people are continuing the Drake song saying, always trying to get, always trying to let go of anything that'll burden me. Got to be faster than me to get to me. And then a little further down, someone says, your caption is slaying me. So he saw that people are liking that his captions, saw that a lot of people use Drake captions in their um, Instagram, or Drake lyrics in their Instagram captions. But the user experience of it was a little bit off. You know, you have this, you know you're in Germany, you know you want to flex, let people know you're in Germany. I'm in London, I want to let people know. Um, but you have to like Google a Drake lyric if you don't know it right off. Um, like other random stuff will come up on Google sometimes. So, and worse, have y'all seen where people just put like insert Drake caption here? Like they're really struggling at that point. Like they need a solution to their Instagram caption game, right? So Kyle came up with one because that's what Kyle does. Um, and it's called Drakestagram. But I am not going to talk about it too much. What's up, everyone? I'm going to let Kyle take Kyle, it over. Checking in from San Francisco, California. And I just want to show you something really quickly that I built called Drakestagram. I'm a huge Drake fan, and I noticed a lot of people on Instagram use Drake lyrics as their captions on Instagram. So I figured I would help people and make their lives a little easier. So I created a website called Drakestagram where you can type in um, a keyword that matches the vibe of your photo, like what you want your caption to be about. And then you would type that into Drakestagram, hit enter, and it'll return to you back a lyric that you can use as your caption. So we can type London, for example. And here's an example Drake quote. Uh, yeah, remember you was living at the London for a month. And so to take it a step further, I made it a lot easier so you don't even have to go to drakestagram.com. You can just text a phone number. So I want everyone to pull their uh, phones out. Katie won't mind, I promise. And uh, text plus one. It's a U.S. number, so you have to put plus one. 404-253-2677. And text your keyword to that phone number, and it will give you back a Drake lyric that you can use as your caption. Hope you all enjoy. Thanks. All right, so y'all heard Kyle. Pull out your phones. If y'all don't want to, um, yeah. So it's an Atlanta number. So if you don't, if you can't text, um, can y'all not text using the plus one? You can, or maybe you don't want to. That's cool too. Um, that's fine. You can go to drakestagram.com and then type in your keyword. So I'm gonna give y'all a little bit of time to do that. I'm gonna do it too, and just holler out at me. Um, when you get a, when you get something back, and let me know what your keyword is and what the lyric was. And it might go a little slower since everyone's trying to do it at the same time, but it works, I promise. Y'all got one. Kyle would be pleased, though. <laughs> you got one? What was your keyword? Crazy, I guess? Oh, life. Yeah, this life is crazy. Did it say what song it's from? You and the Six? Anyone else got one yet? Your mama used to live at the church on Sunday. What was your keyword? Sunday? Okay, nice. Anyone on this side using it? Is it working? Is it only this side that works? Okay. Say it again. I'm going to ask you one more time, homie. What was the song? Poetic Justice? Okay, cool. I put in um, writing, since I'm a writer. And it says, I'm writing you from a distance like a pen pal, but we've been down too much. I also put in Google, because Google Maps has been saving my life in London. Like, I love Google Maps. I have a whole new appreciation. It says, but this blank look like the trap on this Google Maps, though. Walk it like I talk it. But Migos, okay, cool. 
Any other results on this side? What was your um, keyword? <laughs> They're not talking about technology right there. <laughs> cool. So as you can see from this example, Kyle's expertise is lies in computer science. But he's also a black dude from Atlanta. He likes rap. He loves Drake. And so he made this thing that people can just text or um, go on the website and use it for Instagram. So we have texting, SMS, accessible, um, Twitter, Instagram, accessible, and his website's pretty accessible. You just type in the words. So like I said, using his expertise. And then it's a pretty simple application. So showing that to the people who are interested in making their own app, it doesn't have to be the fanciest thing. It doesn't have to be a Google Maps um, for it to be fun and to work and like serve your purpose. Um, so this is a quote that I really resonate with. It says, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories, and I keep on remembering mine. And that's Lucille Clifton, um, a poet, and the poem is called Why People Be Mad at Me Sometimes. And when I introduced myself, did y'all catch that I said I got my degrees in public policy and I focused on health disparities, which like has kind of nothing to do with writing? Did you think, like, what? what? How, how did you start writing? Like, how do you be a technical writer um, talking about sharecropping? I, I ask myself that too sometimes. Um, and the answer is that um, a couple years ago, I was working at the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. So like the government. And I was a project assistant. Um, and I got laid off. Middle of the day, they're like, get out. I was like, oh, OK. Um, I was living with my parents, um, which I didn't want to do. They were charging me rent, which I thought was unfair. And I didn't have a job now. Um, I was also in an abusive relationship where I was depressed and I was getting gaslighted, or maybe the past tense is gaslit. I'm not sure. But um, I started writing just to like keep a record of like what happened. Because things would happen, he'd be like, that didn't happen. I'm like, maybe it didn't happen. So I would keep a, a record, just writing, keeping a record. And so then, after I was, got through with like the journaling, I would still journal, but then I would like talk to trusted friends and be like, oh, this happened, you know. I tell them about my problems, but then we like talk about other things like current events and what's going on. And have y'all ever experienced this? Like you have a conversation with somebody, and then like two days later, the exact thing you see. Um, the exact thing you said is like an article in some major publication. So like, I just said that. Like, is that that's the thing? And I would I would experience that so many times. I'm like, all right, I need to get paid for these hot takes that I'm um, having. So I, was, I started writing. Right? It wasn't just like my story anymore. I was like, I need to document some other things. I need to be um, writing down these conversations I have and like make them accessible to other folks. So that led me to um, becoming a staff writer at a publication and being able to write about um, black people. Um, it, the publication is called Bustle. It's a lifestyle women's magazine. And most of the writers and all of the editors are white. Um, and I noticed they really weren't talking about things that my friends were talking about, what I thought was important. Or if they were, it was very surface level, not nuanced. And I wanted to bring an extra layer to that. And I even had the opportunity to write about some people who are at the conference. So you're going to hear um, from Dr. Courtney Ziegler uh, right after me, the Appalachian app. So donate your spare change to help pay bail for people. Um, I wrote about that. Got to slide in his DMs and interview him. Um, Momo Pixels, Hair Naw, 8-bit um, video game, wrote about that. And like all these things wouldn't have been gotten written about if I wasn't on staff because no one was in these spaces where people were talking about it, but me at the time. And I also wrote about Erica Gardner. Um, have y'all heard of her? Um, so for those who haven't, she's the daughter of Eric Gardner, who was killed by the police, um, I believe, in 2016, um, supposedly for ser selling loose cigarettes on a corner. Um, his last words were, I can't breathe. And that um, sparked a movement in the US. And she. Um, 
was an activist and died within a year of having her child. So I talked about how racism in, in America is also impacting maternal mortality in black women. And so it's having these um, spiraling effects that people aren't really like necessary, necessarily looking at straight on. So like, oh, racism, you go to jail, you might die. It's like, no, you go to jail, your father dies, you die, your kid doesn't have a mom. It, it goes on and on, right? Um, so I hopped into the writing space, and I kind of did that on my own, not really thinking much of it. And then my friends are like, yo, Katie, like, how are you in all these publications? Like, how does that happen? It kind of seems like a black, a black box of, like, how you go from having an idea or, like, tweeting something to having your name on these bylines. So what I do is um, I actually do writing coaching, and I use Google Hangouts. Super accessible. Like, I hop on the video chat with my people that are interested. I'm working now with a woman who's getting her PhD in mathematics in Michigan. And she definitely has a very unique lived experience. Black woman, um, went to a tech school, now is getting her PhD in math, um, the only person, only black person in her program, right? So she has a very unique experience and has something that she could share with parents, with administrators, even with legislators. Um, but she needs to craft that in a way that is um, accessible to people. You know how academics write sometimes, right? It's really convoluted, um, really high up there, and it's scary to some people. So now we're working on how to make what she's saying plain and in layman's terms so that people can understand it and um, can vibe with it. Um, so now is the part where I'm gonna get down and talk to y'all. So think about who you are. Oh, you can't see that. It says, who are you? Um, and so these are some things that you can think about. Notice I'm not asking you like where you work or what you got your degrees in, um, how much money you have, but think about who you are and your lived experience, what expertise you have um, in regards to that, and then think about how you can share that expertise in an accessible way. Um, so buddy up, partner up, small group it up, and chat about that for a while and I'll be back. And for anyone on the live stream, you can use the hashtag AfroTechFest to share yours out too. Yeah, so like your personal experiences and how you can package that in a way to share that knowledge to someone else.
was in my head about, yeah, I'm finding myself in this new area, and all right, what, what should I do? I need to get back to where I grew up, so I'll just kind of go for it. All right, y'all. We should have a mic out there somewhere. So did y'all have a pretty good conversation? Did y'all come to any new insights? Yes, no? Just chit-chatting. Does anyone want to share um, anything that they came up with? Hey, um, so I'm, I'm at the front over here. Um, so I'm really, I'm really passionate about um, tattoos and tattoo culture and piercings and that whole body modification industry. And something I'm really interested in is like making tattoos wearable technology, like so um, on the microdermal level. Um, so that kind of combines like some bio material and like things like that. And I just really hate the idea, like one of my fears is not being able to pursue something that I enjoy that is also being able to support my family. And like I think like a lot of people struggle with that. And so I think I'd love to be able to put those two together and actually make something productive that's actually going to help people as well as support people in other ways. Um, so what's your name and can people contact you on any of these accessible technologies to help you out with this? Yes, yeah, so I'm KJ, and um, you can find me on Twitter at Kira PF Tech. So K I R A P F Tech. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you for sharing, KJ. Um, anyone else um, want to share out their expertise? You don't have to have it all the way teased out. Um, if it's something you've already talked about to a lot of people here, trust me, it's okay. Anyone else? All right. Um, there goes the mic. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Hi, it's Kian. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. My name's Dominique, and I have a business called Hair Puff, and it's all about kind of hair enthusiasts and hair care brands, specifically in the black and brown and natural hair care brands in Great Britain, because I found a lot of disparity between the kind of the UK brands I hear and kind of the old kind of gold standard American brands, and also kind of having a, a business platform for like the different brands in the UK to be able to give them advice and kind of help them with their kind of legal. And I really want to be able to use those platforms for the marketplace to solve the problem of when black women definitely don't want to have good hair care and they want to wear it when they feel like they're feeling it or they ask for people and stuff for help and that can't happen. So through the platform, I really want to kind of help people solve the problem of why they don't want to use it or their hair and why they don't want to get hair care because they don't want to feel embarrassed and stuff or look like they're having a problem. Sure. Um, how can people get in touch with you at HairPuff? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at HairPuff with two Es, so that's H-A-I-R-P-U-F-F. And I've been tweeting a lot about it, so if you're interested, you can kind of check my profile out. Great. I think um, the person in front of you, did you have your hand up? Uh, I was just going to say um, I'm, uh, I'm a web developer, um, not for the fashion firm, but I do a whole bunch of other things. Um, I am hoping to be able to um, maybe contribute a way to a um, an open source um, platform um, with my. Um, I've been doing I've been doing web development for about um, six years, um, but that I normally work within revenues and benefits and health and welfare and stuff like that. Um, so um, I am um, quite keen on um, contributing to that as well. So um, great. Yeah, so those are um, benefits that we have over here that we share as well. Mm -hmm. So that's um, why I was just thinking about that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people like need to know more information about that, right? Yeah, my name is Raymond. Um, I have a Twitter handle at um, Ray Tom Web, and um, um, I have a Facebook and Etsy as well, um, Ray Thompson Web Dev. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Was there one more? Okay, let's get it. Oh. Hi, everyone. So my name is Lydia, and I'm a single parent, and I'm very passionate about putting the single parent issues to the forefront. 
and um, becoming vegetarian, I realized there's not a lot of platforms that are dedicated to that, or there's it's very difficult to find one place where you can find all the resources that you need. Mm. So um, during my maternity leave, I thought, why not develop something rather than leave something to us to sort of come along? So I've I, I'm at the idea stage, but um, I want to create an app that can cater to to lone parents, whether you're single for whatever reason, and also rebrand what single parenting is because there's a, a stigma around it that I come to know is not true. And I think a lot of other single parents experience it and it would be good to get that out there, to shine a light on that. And um, the other thing is to also involve um, single fathers because a lot of um, a lot of the platforms that are out there to support parents kind of exclude single fathers, or even fathers in general. So it would be good to have a space where it is dedicated to single parenting and it's including both parents. And um, I've, I'm working on a website right now. Um, it hasn't launched or anything yet. Everything is in the idea stage, but I run a blog where I document my journey. And you can find me on Lydia on Life on Instagram, Twitter, and on my blog as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I love that. Lydia on Life. Did, did you still want to share? Hi, I'm Joy. I spoke earlier, so I'm not going to take too much time. Um, I just wanted to share kind of podcasts on a kind of that's what I'm really into. I don't create my own podcast, but I do listen to a lot. And just as we're in a tech forum and he was here earlier, there's a podcast called Techish, and there's a, also a podcast called Lost in the Source. And there's also my friend's podcast called Tag Me In Podcast. So that's sharing. But feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you want any kind of black British podcast. I have a list. Nice. I'm happy <laughs> to share. Um, so my Twitter is life underscore n underscore joy underscore. Sorry for the underscore. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Can we get uh, applause for yourselves? Thinking about your expertise and sharing them with the group. I love it. Um, so wrapping up, like I said, I do writing coaching. My boss told me to let y'all know that they are hiring at Salesforce. So if you want to work in the London office, want to be remote like me, also hit me up. Um, I am going home tomorrow, but I definitely want to keep this conversation going. Um, I met a lot of cool people here. So um, I'm Black Katie, like I said earlier, B-L-K-K-A-T-I-E. So Black Katie at Gmail, Black Katie on Twitter, and Black Katie on Instagram. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to continue this work and continue the relationship with folks in um, black folks in the UK so thank you so much um, and we can chat after um, thanks for your attention <laughs>